today I'm interviewing uh, Salini and one of her advices is probably the best advice I ever heard. It's, a, it's an advice for educators. And she says, when you are an educator, you need to act as you are the CEO of the classroom and you need to be as crazy as possible when you are the CEO of the classroom. Anyway, this, this interview is full with amazing advices and some of the most creative advices I ever heard from an educator. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Thank you. Hello, Shalini. How are you today? I'm doing very good. Thank you so much. And um, very excited to be here. Well, I'm very excited to talk to you. So, Shalini, there is one question I always start with is that, like, how did you become an educator? Um, and I've also said this so many times, um, it's very exciting to again tell you. So when I passed out of college, of course, I didn't have any plan, you know, like everybody else, ever to become a teacher in my life, never thought about it. And I entered the corporate world of airlines. That's how I started my career. And uh, when I had my daughter, she was five years old. She was, you know, two, two and a half years old. When you start looking for schools in Delhi, and started visiting a lot of schools. And what, uh, you know, really made me think is that why are people not friendly? You know, it's my child, my money, and education should be like, you know, because I traveled all over the world. So I thought, why not, instead of cribbing, get into the system and try and change it. And so that's how I began my journey as a teacher. And I began my journey because I didn't have any teaching qualifications. So I joined, I started as a music teacher because there was some amount of singing I had done and I could play some instruments. So that's how my journey started. But education is like a quicksand, you know. Uh, every time you want to say, okay, I'm not going to do any more, you get more and more absorbed in it because the kids are too much, there's too much love all around. It's amazing. So, so you got into this, first of all, as a parent, then the, the thing that actually shocked you was the, the attitude. It was not, yeah. it was not even the education itself. It was like, like this supposed to be a friendly environment, not a yeah. hostile environment to the customer. Right. Uh, and, and, and then started the journey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very, very. And, and okay. So you start there, this, but still, this is still the beginning. You become a music teacher. What happens after that? So I became a music teacher and I must share one very funny incident and I was six months into my job and every day I would say, okay, I think I'm going to leave, but then I didn't because I just loved the affection I got from the kids. And then my principal came to me, he said, I think you can teach. I said, sir, I can't teach. He said, no, no, I think you can teach. So I said, okay, fine. So he said, tomorrow you come prepared for a social science class and uh, I'll observe you and then we'll take a call. I said, okay. I went back home and see that time we did not have, uh, you know, Ami, right? Am I pronouncing your name right, Ami? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that time we didn't have any Google or internet or chat GPT to go to, so you had to think yourself. So I still remember I took a hanger and hung all the planets I'm supposed to teach next day went to the class full of enthusiasm with my armored with my resources and I started teaching them and uh, when I finished the class went back home and reflected I realized I taught them wrong I taught them Pluto was the largest planet because that time Pluto did exist which was wrong and I went back to the kids next day I said why didn't you stop me when I was wrong they said ma'am you were so full of excitement so much of energy we didn't want to tell you <laughs> So I, I think uh, that's what made me realize. And I remember my principal telling me, you're made for this. So I, I really, I think I've been a crazy teacher all throughout. I like making, for me, what is very, very important is making a difference in a child's life. The pleasure you get when you're able to see a child who says, no, I can't do it. And you bring that, bring him up to the level where he says, okay, I can do it or I can try. I think it's the biggest, uh, you know, aha moment for me. And, and what about the transition from teaching in the classroom to become a principal, which is different? Uh, yeah. you know, it's a different skill. <laughs> so I find that very weird. Again, one secret I'm sharing. So as a teacher, you go through a lot of emotional traumas. There are a lot of people who control you. Uh, there are so many things. And I used to promise myself the day I sit on the administrative seat, I will 
make sure that my teachers do not go through what I went through as a teacher. So my uh, intent has been to make it a very happy place wherever I've worked, where all stakeholders, children should be happy, parents, support staff, everybody should be happy. That's the intent. So you know, so so th this actually takes me to the to you know to the next layer of of, uh, of question. You know, uh, th there's like lots of challenges now that children are facing, uh, whether it comes from uh, more uh, you know the impact of social media on education or you know the impact of COVID, uh, etc. And there's lots of uh, challenges that uh, mm -hmm. you know the parents are facing. You know, it's it's a very uh, you know, if education kind of looked the same for many years, uh, yeah. not, now it's uh, it's actually changing very fast. Uh, yeah. Starting for the fact that in the past the teacher had to be in front of the children and teach them, you know, Ooh. about like the solar system. Now the kids don't really need it; they have yeah. access to the information. It's more it's more about like you know how to get them in engaged. So what what do you think are the challenges that you mm -hmm. see now that uh, children and parents uh, mm -hmm. are facing uh, in the mm -hmm. education system? I I think uh, you know uh, life changes, life moves on, and we need to move forward. So the biggest thing is for anybody to be able to survive the change, you need to unlearn whatever you have learned, and be always into, especially in the education sector. Uh, the kind of people who should come in are the people who are always excited to learn because you learn in a classroom with children, you learn in a field, you learn in a bus because children are much more ahead than where we are. So I think, of course, we are moving. In fact, today I was reading a very funny article that this child used AI to answer all his worksheets. And he used AI to even copy his handwriting to do that, and teacher could make out the difference. No, we are we have to be prepared for this kind of world. We can't be now shocked because these things will happen in the years to come. So, how as a parent and as a school, I think what is very important to pay a lot of emphasis on the EQ of a child, emotional quotient. I think there's somewhere forgetting that the mental health of a child, uh, become more of a counselor, guide the children. I think those kind of sessions are much needed today because a child can come up to me and says, hey, I don't need you. I can go and learn at home. And he can. In fact, chat GPT will give him more knowledge than what I can probably. But the point is, how do you make the children understand the value system, the roots and everything? I think those are very important. The challenge which I foresee, unless the teachers decide to change, uh, there will be a problem. There will always be a huge gap. And with the parents, I feel the parents are so busy. See, this is the younger generation of parents. They themselves are on their phones half the time. And them being on the phone and telling the child not to use the mobile is a far cry. So they need to be also consciously, like now you have so many groups, so many restaurants, so many places which have come up that, okay, you leave your phone away. And I think spending more time with your child, because we will be surrounded by machines, we will be working on AI a lot, and we cannot run away from that. So instead of being scared, Instead of saying, oh, my God, how are we going to manage? We need to, I think we have time to prep up and prepare ourselves of how we are going to be dealing with that. A child will be able to make a worksheet. I mean, come on, you can't make out. You and me wouldn't be able to make out. But then right. how do we integrate that knowledge in him? So we'll have to look at more creative ways of teaching in the classroom. And I think that is where I say the teachers need to unlearn. Yeah, you know, and if you look throughout history, not to this space, uh the the young generation were always uh adopting new edu uh, new technologies uh, yeah. faster than their parents you know it's it's even uh you know we, we saw it in the industrial revolution we saw it uh you know with, like yeah. we saw it with, with the internet coming and definitely we see yeah. it now with uh, with ai and it always creates this gap it always creates a gap between the na it's an, a natural thing you know the, the parents yeah. and the educators are slower yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so the, the challenge is really to right. educate. Like we, we see that it's much e easier. To, I'm just giving it as an example. It's much easier to teach a child to use a mobile phone rather than t teaching yeah. the grandparents of the child to use a mobile phone, right? Yeah. So, so, so we have this permanent gap, and you're saying this is about uh, uh, the skill. So, if if, uh, if I kind of try to zoom 
on uh, what is the biggest challenge do you, do you see? I, I think you've already answered it, but I want to make sure we, didn't fa we don't uh -huh. miss it. What, what is the biggest challenge that we are uh, facing as educators, uh, families, uh -huh. and children? I think one, uh, I would say two. One biggest challenge is when you look around yourself, I mean, uh, nobody wants to be a teacher. I mean, you ask the children in the class, do you want to be a teacher? Uh, they, every other profession they want, but nobody says, hey, I want to be a teacher. So I'm just wondering, like 15 years hence, where are we going to get teachers? Is it AI going to be taking over the classroom? And that I think nobody is actually talking about, but that's the biggest challenge. And if you see the kind of people who are getting into education, sometimes you wonder, oh my God, really? You know, so I, I think that is, we need to raise create an awareness campaign where people are aware of the benefits of this kind of a profession. I mean, it's very satisfying. And the second very important thing is AI is coming at very quick pace. It's coming at very quick pace. And we are still in a comfort zone thinking, oh my God, when it'll come, we'll see. And it's a fact. We are actually not prepared. That's what I'm saying today when I read this article and everybody wrote, oh my God, how shocking. It's not shocking. It is the world now what it's going to be. So I think being mentally prepared of the change and creating an action plan of how we are going to be dealing with AI in the classroom, how we are going to be dealing with the super intelligent kids, because at the age of five, they have access to everything. You know, they, in fact, now I was reading where the technology has gone. I don't know, in one of the countries in US or Europe, I don't know, they're developing these pods where this is the future, where the IQ will be, you know, through a vaccine or injection, it'll be put. I mean, things are happening and this may sound weird at the moment, but I think it's the, it's the future. So we need to be prepared and we need to be always ready to learn, which I think is the biggest challenge because people are in their comfort zone and they, I mean, I'm not talking about a certain fewer percentage, I'm talking about the large mass of population where we need to be prepared of how this change will impact us and create a plan of how a school will look like, how a personalized learning plan will look like, how a classroom will look like and be ready for that. I think so the larger emphasis is on getting good quality teachers and training them, which is very important. You know, in Israel, I, I, I live in Israel and um, we've seen this problem with the quality of teacher for decades now. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, if some, I, and I'm not even talking now, I'm talking even 15, 20 years ago, uh, uh -huh. when we do say to somebody, hey, you know, you can work in Google for Google or you uh -huh. can teach in a school, you know, A, it pays much more, uh, you feel much better. And so the quality of teachers yeah. went downhill uh, yeah. very, very fast. And if you look at the education system, it's really composed of very uh, committed young people. So young people that go there for the ideology of the impact and uh, and a lot of teachers that are kind of old school. And the thing is, when you're trying to plan and you're trying to adjust, uh, it is very, by the time you finish your plan, Mm -hmm. uh that it's it's irrelevant by the way it's not only in education it's true in in many spaces every, now every step, yeah and uh, and I, and i think it takes us to a place if the education system didn't change for so many years yeah. uh suddenly it's changing you know i'll, I'll just give you the example of pre-books you know pre-books started when uh when i came i actually wrote a children's book and I said, hey, you know, it doesn't make sense that uh, I can do a website, but I cannot do a web, uh, you know, a book in the same uh -huh. time, right? So, so I kind of uh, uh, convinced my co-founders and said, like, let's build the platform. Yeah. And to build the Brie books, the first Brie books version was very, very, very fast. And uh, and I thought, you know, it would be something that few thousand kids are using in order to publish their yeah. books. Uh, in the first year, it was more than 200,000 kids, only in India, by the way, okay. that published a printed, uh, a printed uh, a book. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Children are writing books. But suddenly, I started to see that a certain section of the writers, including my son, by the way, uh -huh. they were more focused on the business side of the book, which yeah. is strange 
but they were so engaged in the concept of earning money uh, yeah. like uh, uh, offers royalties from the book and my I, my son is paying for all his uh, his toys all his games with money he makes from books and i saw i saw kids in india that made you know sold like 5000 books yeah. and but i it's not a financial transaction. They will not become wealthy from this. It's the understanding that they can start their own business, that they can be entrepreneurs. Yeah, so absolutely. they almost went, went through a business school because they know how to create a product, package the product, sells the product, promote their product, and they are seven or nine or something like this. Yeah. So, and I'm using Bibooks as a tiny example in the education uh -huh. world because there's like, thousands of disciplines like this and uh, it is so for me when i look at education it's and i look at it from the angle of educator you really need and ai is exactly the same you need yeah. to be on high alert and you need to know how to bring those things in the right quantity as well you don't want Absolutely. everything to be chat gpt right yeah. it's like it would be terrible we will all be dumb so uh and and that's that's for me a big a big challenge um so yeah. Uh, when it, you know you run a very uh, like a big group now, when a new teacher comes into your organization, what's the advice as you give them? So uh, we we have of course our induction process and uh, you know, making them familiar. Um, I think one biggest advice is uh, which uh, I personally feel is very important. I tell them you are the CEO of the class, and let's see how crazy you can be in the class. Because I think what children need is a teacher who goes beyond herself, who's able to connect. I may be, I may have all the knowledge, but if I cannot connect with a child, I won't be able to teach. So I think that is what matters to me. And of course, to integrate technology, because you know, if you're going to be teaching English or math, how you'll be using technology in the classroom, because it's not about anything else, because the children love it. They have more ease of understanding because these this is the Gen Z. And it becomes easier, you know. And actually, I tell you, uh, technology has made our life very easy. You know, we don't realize it. I mean, sitting here on my dashboard, I know how many children. This is a huge school of 5,000 kids. But I know how many kids are present in each class today by 8.15, which if technology was not there, would not have been possible. You know, I need to check the lesson plan. I know exactly how many people have uploaded. So I think um, what my advice to the new teacher is that firstly, she needs to be continuously learning and upgrading her skills. Now, when we talk about the skills, I think the most important skill, of course, besides communication, collaboration, all those other skills are the digital skills. And then, of course, I think another thing which is very important as a group is, uh, is the teacher aware of the cybersecurity threats? Is she aware how she's going to be dealing with that? So we try and make our teachers aware so that they understand how not to go berserk with technology, but to know how to effectively utilize it for learning. And I think that's very important. I, I love I love this concept of like you know you're CEO of your class and you need to be as crazy as possible. <laughs> this is the best advice I ever heard for a teacher. I, I have to admit, and uh, uh, and it's true. This is exactly what they have to do. Okay, yep. last question. Uh, very similar. Uh, what advice do you give uh, children when they start to join your organization? And I, I'm I mean like in the later yeah. ages in life, uh, you know. So if you ask me what advice I give and I have given for past 30 years, I like people to dream big. And I think uh, what we do, what we tell children, and that's why I joined education is, OK, how do you fit in this? How do you study? And if you study, this happens. You know, I mean, children can come back to you and say, hey, this guy did, dropped out of college and he's a billionaire. <laughs> you know, so today the world has changed and children can question you. So to make them understand, I think it's very important that they must dream big and they must write down their dreams. And this is something I really tell children and tell them that stick to it and work hard, you will achieve it. And it's my greatest pleasure when some of the students who I taught many years ago have been able to achieve their dreams, have been able to reach their goals. I think that's the biggest, uh, you know, aha for a teacher. Wait, but I have, I, have, I have a difficult question for you. A lot of children tells you, even when they're like, not even children, even adults, 
They tell you, I, I don't know what's my dream. Yeah. But how do you deal with that? Um, I, I think with children, they're malleable. If you tell them something and if they love you, if they like you, because I'm not that scary kind of a school head. I'm a very, very, my drawers are open. The children send me messages on Instagram. You don't know, you know, that, okay, they complain, let us come on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on wherever they are. They find me on social media, which is very interesting. And uh, I, I think it's very important for that openness, because of that openness, because there is a connect with them. And that is why, if that is why for a teacher, besides all technology, anything, the first thing a teacher needs to do is to build a connect. If you are connected with the child, they will listen to you. So when you tell them out of, let's say, <clears throat> out of 2,000 kids, even if 100 kids have big dreams, I think that's a, that's a big success. By, by, by the way, um, I, I don't remember where it was. Uh, it's somewhere, uh -huh. uh, if, maybe it's in the UK or in the US, but uh -huh. one school did, the, did something uh, with ReBooks when they uh they asked kids on a certain age uh, uh -huh. to write a book they gave them like a like a mission to write a book about their dream oh. and uh on the on the maybe you should do the Let's same check. thing and uh it's not related to the national young Welfare affair or something like that. Yeah, so they yeah, said yeah. okay you have a, you have like a, a certain period of time and your goal is to write a book and to publish a book about their dream and then the the school actually keeps those books about their dreams this is okay. actually not for like massive distribution yeah. it's like they they created the but but they, they have literally a shelf in the library yeah. with their yeah. dreams and the point there i think is to ex I, I assume is to show them their dreams oh. later yeah. on in life and to play with it that it sounds like very fascinating mm -hmm. uh thank you very much i i learned so many interesting things i'm definitely going to take the ceo and become as crazy as possible uh, <laughs> uh, uh and i think every educator should should uh, learn it yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much i i really enjoyed because i love chatting anything about yeah. education and i look forward to meeting you soon not virtually maybe in real oh, life for sure in one of the, for sure in one of the previous yeah, events yeah. we come for a visit thank you very very, very thank you. Much. pleasure pleasure thank you